actually kindness is probably the most important thing you can have in business because especially as I know that kindness, generosity and altruism stimulates the best um, uh, chemical makeup for the brain to be effective and efficient. I just thought, these professors are here just for me. Oh my goodness me, they are going to be, because I've been a mother, I've been doing, I've been looking after and now those people were there to teach me. Evolutionary biology is a bit slow. It's not as quick as the, the advent of the smartphone. Yeah. Okay. So therefore, what we find we do is we are in overwhelm. Today's guest is Dr. Linda Shaw. Linda holds a doctorate in cognitive neuroscience, specializing in unconscious processing of emotion and behavioral change. She's also an author, entrepreneur, and the past president of the Professional Speaking Association UK and Ireland. As the founder of Brain and Behaviour, Linda now works with senior leaders and their teams to use the neuroscience of behaviour to unlock their natural genius and to communicate their ideas more effectively. I've known Linda for several years now and not only is she an absolute expert in her field, but she also has a boundless energy and an infectious zest for life which infuses everything she does. So it's a privilege to have her on the show to share her wisdom. If you enjoy what you hear, please leave a review, like, comment and subscribe. It would mean the world to me and will help this podcast reach as many people as possible. You don't want to miss this. Enjoy. Linda, welcome to the show. In, in life, what is the most important thing that you've ever had to pitch for? What's the most important thing? I've, wow, that's a really big question as an opener. Um, one of my <laughs> really big thing that I've had to pitch for um, probably a bank loan for a health club that I owned way back a thousand years when I had to build it up from nothing, including the building. And so I needed, um, we thought we could do it on our own money, but it turned out that we couldn't. We had to go in for bank money, which was a shame because interest rates were extortionately high. So that was a big pitch. And I had we grew it to 2,000 members. I had 20 staff. So it was there was a lot riding wow. on it. That was probably my biggest thing. Um, okay. And I know Tony staff doesn't sound a lot, but it was for little old me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and and did uh, I'm presuming you got you got the loan? Yeah, yeah. It was all good. It was so all what... good. It, it was it was tough going because yeah. as I said, you know, interest rates were so high. This is why I, I fear um, these days, because we've had generations who are used to low interest rates and they don't know that what it can feel like and it can feel really bad. So, um, yeah, please be careful out there. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit of extra advice on the podcast. If you if you take yourself back to that moment of having to walk in and, and see the bank manager and ask them for um, that that money, like what sort of level of preparation did you do before oh, you had to walk in there? 30 odd page business plan. Yeah. Big, yeah. Really big business plan. We, uh, I was very well prepared. My husband, who's a businessman and he's been in the sales director for a thousand billion years. Um, he helped me with that business plan and it, and he's very thorough. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's, it was everything that, we wanted and why we wanted it and what the marketplace was like and what could go wrong and what we would do if it went wrong. I mean, it was really thorough. And in terms of rehearsal, did you uh, did you rehearse it out loud or was it kind of thinking through in your head? No, I tend not to do that. I tend just to go for it. I'm 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 actually one of my natural talents is communication. And it's not I'm not bragging because I've got plenty of <laughs> no talent whatsoever in many areas. <laughs> um, so um, I I I tend to um, read other people. I, I okay. so I, I would be um, working very much with the uh, personality and the communication skills and what I was reading from the person I was pitching to. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, so if if that was the kind of biggest pitch, is, are there any pitches that got away? Is there is, you know any any jobs or opportunities that you thought, oh, I really wish that that had come off? Do you know, no, I don't. My my, my as you know, I've got a small business now, um, and my pet dislike in the whole journey of of trying to get a sale is the marketing end. Right. It's 
Yeah, it's getting the leads. That's the tough one. For me, conversion's easy. I, I actually convert really well, but gosh, I don't like that marketing malarkey. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole other subject for, a, for another podcast. Yeah, um, you, you, you're a, a cognitive neuroscientist. You're also an entrepreneur, as you've alluded to there. You're the past president of the Professional Speaking Association for UK and Ireland. Uh, you're an author. To be honest, I'm not sure where you have the time for all of this sort of stuff. Um, but but what's your story like? Take take me back as a, as a kid. What did you want to be when you grew up? Well, <laughs> I wanted to be a nun. <laughs> <laughs> I was not expecting that. <laughs> I wanted to be a nun. I'm being terribly honest with you. Um, I wanted to be a nun, not because I'm religious, because I, but because I wanted to have sisters. Um, <laughs> I didn't know that you had to be religious to be a nun when I was a child. I thought you just had sisters, and I'm an only child. So okay. I wanted sisters. <laughs> Isn't that awful? <laughs> uh, when, when did you find out that that wasn't kind of, you know, the only bit of the deal? Well, there was a... <laughs> there were a few things in, in our English language that foxed me about that time. And, and things like when people said the right honourable on the news, I thought they were being sarcastic. <laughs> 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 really wasn't right at all. Um, and, you know, um, Hamilton Academicals, when the football result was wrong, I thought that was a joke. I thought nobody, why would it, I thought that was not correct. Um, so that I could see that there was an issue with my understanding of certain things. And I think that's what children do. They they interpret things in the way that makes sense to them, their point yeah. of reference. So that's what I did. So it's when I got to the stage where I, I was more um, astute with the breadth of meaning. So I was probably about 19 or 20. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably about, I don't know, 10, nines or tens or something. It dawned on me. Yeah. Being a nun actually was not just to have sisters. Sisters. <laughs> So after the nun phase, what was what, what was the next kind of ambition? Well, I've I've always been a communicator. I I've even as a child, I would be sit talking to really old people because I just wanted to know what it was like for them when they were my age, and I was mm -hmm. fascinated. And I think that's the anthropologist in me. And I've always wanted to travel, so traveling became a very big thing. And actually, getting involved with with the um, local communities, I like doing very much. Um, but when I was 14, I started to read about consciousness. And um, that has been a big thread for me right the way through. But that's, that, was a type, that was the subject of my doctorate. So I have been really following that since I was 14, is this mm. topic of consciousness, which is so difficult because it's like the last frontier in our, in our known universe. Now, it's really, really a tough topic with loads of contradictions and very little understanding and uh, neuroscience is doing doing its best but by no means have we got the answers so it's mm. a topic that drives me absolutely drives me so i work an awful lot now with unconscious processing with reading people um and and communicating better and also to um de to develop the genius in people um, genius ideas. We are so badly in need of genius ideas on this planet because it's burning and drowning. And I don't want to leave that to the next generations. And I, mm. that's, that's what's driving me now is I'm very keen to, to tap into my knowledge of the unconscious brain and my, my knowledge of communication and actually draw out innovative ideas from people. Amazing. As a 14 year old, like, how did you begin that process of grappling with with consciousness like you you said it was something you you read like did did you have teachers that explored those aspects with you because if i think back to my education as a sort of 13 14 year old and the sort of science classes it was it was pretty curriculum led there wasn't necessarily that opportunity to to reflect and explore yeah the teachers didn't at all um, stimulate the curiosity for me about consciousness. It was it was my own reading. It was my I was always interested in um, making sense of why people do what they do. Mm -hmm. I was really keen on trying to learn why people do, which is why I studied psychology and social anthropology at university. But um, yeah, that's what 
that's what got me. Why is it that older person did this back in the 19 something or others? You know, mm-hmm. why is that? So that, that came from my childhood curiosity. And it's always, always why people do what they do. So I just started reading. Um, oh gosh, well, there's one here. Um, how to, I've got, I've got a new copy actually, How to Win Friends and Influence People, Dale Carnegie. Dale Carnegie, okay. The Carnegie, sorry. Yeah, so it's very um, um, uh, old stuff, old books. And mm-hmm. that's what I started reading. Um, and uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People, those sorts of books. And then that developed into well, consciousness. What does it mean when we're dreaming? What does it mean when you know? I started reading about people who had near-death experiences? And what, what, what does that mean? And is it true? And so then then I started thinking, well, oh, crumbs, what's happening in the brain when that happens? Oh, off I went. <laughs> <laughs> so you, so you went to university and and studied that as a, a as a, bat, a bachelor as a first degree. Did you then go on and do a master's? What how what were the kind of stepping stones to ending up with a, a doctorate? Well, I um I actually didn't. I was a mature student. I didn't go to university as for straight from school. What I wanted to do straight from school was travel. Okay. Um, and in those days, I didn't know anything about a, a gap year. And if even if there was such a thing, I didn't know about it. So I start, I actually became a stewardess with British Airways, a cabin crew. Amazing. And it was, yeah, I did, because I got my uniform on. And, and in those days, um, we had lots of time off in those amazing places that I may not have chosen to gone, have gone to for a holiday. So it was fascinating. I really, I was, I was a dreadful tourist. I was out there with my camera, you know, I'm there amongst the people. I'm wanting to go down to the zoo. I want to go to this. I want to go to that. just, just a sponge for all of this stuff. And then I left the airline and I started as a businesswoman and I had a catering business. Um, and I, I got, the only time I've done my best marketing was in those days because what had happened was I um I was I had this catering business I was young I was you know I didn't look like the back end of a bus and I wanted talking about food <laughs> well, that's good so I chose to go to the NEC and it was a, a an IT conference and in, um exhibition rather and in those days the, the uh, people on the stands were mostly men yeah. so I chose the third day when they were all exhausted, sick of rotten coffee, disgusting coffee, horrible lighting, they haven't had any fresh air, and there's this little female walking along with her high heels talking about food. Yes, I got 60 <laughs> leaves that day. Yes, get in. <laughs> and those 60 leaves I converted, and that's that built my business. In that one day's work built my business, and I, my first year's turnover was really, really good. Amazing. So, um, yeah, that was that was fantastic. So the coaching business happened. Then I trained to teach exercise, and then I started the health club, which built we built from scratch. And then, um, uh, then I made babies, and I carried on teaching. Uh, and then, um, uh, my dad used to say to me, Linda, if there's anything, any way you want to understand anything spiritual in this world, go to the Himalayas. And dad died very suddenly. And just after that, I was at the school gates and this woman came up to one of the mums said, oh, I'm going to the Himalayas. I went, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. She said, well, you can't because the group's already made up. We we, we can't, you can't come, there's no space. I went, "Mm, okay. Anyway, a couple of weeks later, she said to me, actually, somebody's just dropped out. Do you want to join us? I went, yes. I didn't even speak to my husband. Yes, I'm coming. Left my two children, um, who were absolutely fine, because uh, I still had my mum to look after them and my husband to look after them. And um, I went to the Himalayas. And whilst I was up there, which was a year and three days after my dad died, it was his birthday, it would have been his birthday, and they opened a temple and they did a ceremony for him. Well, I was blown away. Oh, wow. Absolutely blown away. So when I got home, all I wanted to do was look at firelight or candles or I didn't want to be here. We even went to a dinner party and I stood up in the middle of the meal and walked out into a different room. That was so rude. I'd never do that normally. And I just, I didn't want to be here. And after three months, um, I thought, okay, wake up, Linda. You're not being fair. You're, you're an only child of a widowed mother. You're a wife. You're a mother of your own children. Get a grip. So I took myself off to night school and I did an English A-level. And I thought, oh, I remember this. And at the same time, 
I spoke to somebody who was doing um, a PhD in anthropology. And I, it was one of those light bulb moments. I said, so what actually is anthropology? And when she told me, it was like, that's what I want to do. I'm driven to understand why people do what they do. But because of the children, I couldn't go to any university in the UK. I had to be close to home. And the university that would accept me as a mature student wouldn't let me do social anthropology as a single um, topic. So I had to choose a second one for a joint honours degree. And I chose psychology by default. I didn't want to study psychology. I just wanted to study social anthropology. Anyway, halfway through the course, social anthropology was so hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's about life. I mean... How big is a topic that, you know, it's everything. I loved it, but I'm one of these people that when I write a 2,000 word essay, I've written 20,000 words because I go, what if? And yes, but. And off I go with mm -hmm. all of these wonderful like, avenues to go down. And they were rabbit holes because now I've got 20,000 words to cut out. I've got to cut out 18,000 for my 2,000 word essay. Oh, it's hard. Anyway, um, but the psychology I found easy. So I got my first degree, I got a first class honours degree in, in both psychology and social anthropology. Then I went to stud, on to study a master's in psychology straight away, full time. And it's all full time. And uh, my supervisor, when I looked at his, um, his biography on the university website, there's all these amazing things. He was such a clever man. All of these amazing things. At the very bottom was the word consciousness. I went, oh, that's it. That's what I want to do. So I went up to Michael, who was the professor, and I said, Michael, will you supervise a PhD on consciousness? He went, yes, absolutely. And that was that. Amazing. So yeah, it's my story. I mean, so, that's a, a big risk to to take, you know, to throw yourself in literally, you know, full, full, full body, both feet, stop what you're doing in terms of work and, you know, where the, where the family's at and go and follow that dream do you think do you do you think the the trip to the himalayas was the catalyst for that in in terms of like opening up your mind to those possibilities to be honest with you the catalyst was my father's death right i think i think his timing when he left this planet would not have started that chain of events and um i would not have a doctorate now if it wasn't for that so it's it's amazing what um, what crosses our path, and it didn't feel risky at all. It was, it didn't feel like a risk. It felt um, like absolutely the thing I must do. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, it's 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 quite astonishing. It's one of those sliding doors things, you know. A lot of the people that will be listening to this podcast will will kind of have those moments where you know they experience imposter syndrome you know self self doubt those those kind of voices in in the head um as a more mature student in in that environment like how did you how did you manage yourself and and make sure that you know you 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 didn't end off up off track because of comparing yourself to others do you know i didn't compare myself unless it was about um technology you know, but in those days, even the youngsters of 18 or 19 were struggling with emailing. Um, so I felt a bit of on an even, even ground with that. Yeah. Um, so the technology um, could have made me feel more d difficult. But I can remember the first day I knew I was accepted and the first day of starting, I was running with excitement, literally, <laughs> sweaty, literally running. I didn't know what to do with myself. I'm running here, running there, running, run, running. And I just thought... Oh, these professors are here just for me. Oh, my goodness me. They are going to be, because I've been a mother, I've been doing, I've been looking after, and now those people were there to teach me. I'm thinking, mm -hmm. I'm just, I was just, like, so grateful that I had this opportunity and these people were willing to impart some of their knowledge to me. I was just So I didn't feel like an imposter syndrome, any imposter syndrome at all. I just felt... Um, incredibly naive and incredibly grateful. That's how I felt. An amazing mindset. In terms of that PhD and and kind of delving into the world of consciousness, what 
what was the biggest thing that you learned and that you bring forward into your work today? The biggest thing I learned was the more I learned, the more I realized how now little I know. And that's, <laughs> that's the truth. Um, I, you know, you go deeper and deeper into a topic and you realize just how enormous these topics are yeah. and how little we know anyway, especially on consciousness. Um, I also learned that to respect people more, I always did anyway as a child, but to respect people more because everybody has their own wealth of knowledge and expertise. Everybody has their gremlins. Everybody has got, you know, that nasty little thing on your shoulder going, nick, 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 We've all got them. And I've, so it's taught me that actually kindness is probably the most important thing you can have in business because especially as i know that kindness generosity and altruism stimulates the best um uh, chemical makeup for the brain to be effective and efficient so that's what i learned more than anything uh, it, it's so fascinating when you kind of d delve into this how how much is in that kind of eastern philosophy um and their way of thinking about the world that that actually, you know, now science is sort of finally catching yeah. up with, with some of the things that those cultures took for granted for, for so long. Yeah, my, my wife's a yoga teacher and, you know, love and kindness are the, the two stalwarts of, of that practice. And uh, I think a lot of businesses could learn a lot from, from going back there. Um, Compassion is huge. Yeah. Compassion is huge. And if we were are more compassionate, we would not have conflict. Um, and, and, and the trouble is, in our world, we are perpetuating a black and white mindset. Especially, you know, you, if somebody says something you don't like, you don't like on Facebook or LinkedIn, you unfriend them. Mm -hmm. I mean, wh where's debate gone? Where yeah. is actually? Let me ask why. Why you think that? Why? What is that? No, but people. A lot of people are actually afraid to ask questions that yeah. would make them feel that they don't know something. That's nonsense. That's the way to learn, way to grow, and way to understand mm. one another. So that's that's what is a, is a big thing for me is that compassion should drive, especially managers, um, because if you've got decent managers, you have got a really good team of people who are going to run that you know go that extra mile for you. Yeah. It's, you know, it's well documented that a lot of a massive percentage of people leave a job because of the manager, not because of the job. So, um, and I think we management skills need to consider um, the people you work for, who, who work for you, and compassion for them, and what what, what their situations are. Hmm. Uh, it strikes me that, that that part of that kind of comes into curiosity as well. So, so just you know, being interested, and in it, it it feels like in in our conversations so far that you are someone that is perpetually curious and always kind of interested to to see what what happens next um if you think about the the kind of challenges that you're seeing with the organizations that you're working with right now what do you think some of the biggest challenges are that people face at work in in 2024 i think one of the biggest challenges we've got um is communication um with our remote working with our hybrid working uh, that's great, absolutely fine, but I, I've seen men in their early 30s crumble with loss of confidence because they're working from home all the time. It's, it's, it's astonishing, and I'm and I'm I am I'm really not being sexist at all. I, I I am not. I don't do bias like that. However, one normally you would think of a 30 year old man as being able to cope with an awful lot more than others, mm -hmm. um, which is really. Um, uh, a, ge a massive generalization which is clearly unfair and unfounded because i'm seeing these people that stereotypically one would think n well, are not going to succumb to lack of confidence and lack of uh, low self-esteem but no they are and they their communication skills are faltering they are um and in the and there's an awful lot of people there who are not as confident as they were, once were mm-hmm they're not amongst it they're not amongst the people and that worries me we are meant to be in our tribes now like hybrid working i get if you working in the office three days a week and you're at home for two i can actually see that's a really good balance but you 
we got to get in amongst the people and we've mm. got to practice our communication skills all of the time properly so from a from a kind of neuroscience perspective then what's what's going on in the brain when we have that opportunity to interact with people face to face and and how does that differ from you know this conversation now as we're talking to each other down the lens of a camera well for a start start with i'm now looking at a little dot at the top of my screen so i'm not there's no eye contact going on so if i'm looking at you there's you're you're now not seeing my eyes so we, yeah. we, we have right, there's no eye contact happening um so that is an issue um we are not shaking hands that is an issue we are we're looking at um cues communication cues that are really quite small we're mm -hmm. not looking at the bigger picture so we're not reading people as well now when we are face to face with someone um, and we are in a business environment, we're smiling, we have eye contact, we have handshake, and to a certain extent that will stimulate oxytocin, mm -hmm. which is the bonding chemical that most people now know about. Um, so the bonding chemical is the one that a woman secretes in abundance when she gives birth or when she's breastfeeding. And she has to bond with the infant. If the, In the old days, and in, certainly in some situations even today, if that woman doesn't bond with her infant, the infant will perish. Mm -hmm. really good reason so this oxytocin is a feedback loop so the more she nurtures her baby the more she wants to nurture a baby the more and it's just just this feedback loop and it's the same with human beings and in a business environment that's how we build trust so if we are not building trust that way it means that we're going to find it harder to actually um, uh, gain trust from our clients and customers um, and that's an issue that's a really big issue, apart from the fact that we need to belong to a small tribe and in-group for our own mental health and emotional health, so which clearly will affect our physical health. So we do need that human connection all of the time. And how can we, if we've only got three days in the office or, you know, we're in a sales context and we're only meeting that person for a very short amount of time, what can we be doing to in increase the likelihood of, of creating that connection when we do have the opportunity? Really good question. Um, I think what we need to do is, if you're a manager of a sales team, for instance, you need to be aware of what your people are like. You need to know what your people are like. Um, so when they come together, there are going to be those who are going to be, I can't cope with all these people, I hate all of that, and don't do all of this, oh my God, whoop, 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 I've just done a deal, I just want to pat on the back, be great, fine, or just a thumbs up, just don't do that to me. So you've got those who are a little bit more introvert, even in sales, <laughs> um, and you have got those who are very extrovert and very different. So you get these groups of people together, so what is very, very important is for everybody to feel heard and feel relevant so mm -hmm. the one emotion that everybody on this planet wants to feel needs to feel is significant so if you have got a two-year-old child who has got your trouser leg going um, me 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 um, we listen 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 and you're going oh, get off i'm busy they're going to feel really insignificant but if you actually um bend down and say what is it darling and they they go off and play then once they've told you Mm. And it's the same as the elderly. If you've got an elderly person, elderly people say this a lot. They say, the trouble with the getting old is I feel invisible. Now, that's cruel. So mm. if, and it goes for all of us. It doesn't matter how old we are. That, we, that doesn't change. So we need to feel valid. We need to feel valuable and what we have to say. So if you have got part of your team that's really gregarious and loud and wants to hog everything, all the conversation, please um practice involving those who are a bit quieter so yeah. they equally feel heard equally feel significant and that's one of the main reasons why you need to get a sales team together on a weekly basis mm. and it's a fun thing you can do fun things but remember the ones who don't want to be plummeted into pizza friday or procedure <laughs> friday or whatever else is going on you know there's some people who really don't like that so you, as a manager of a sales team you really need to know your people and how to how to handle them yeah that's interesting it's it's a, a very kind of animalistic almost 
behavior so i've got mine's going off in a strange direction here but i've got golden retriever two-year-old golden retriever um and that significance is there for for that animal as well he he wants to be seen and and he just like as soon as you've given him a bit of pat and a bit of attention he's like okay good right i can go and relax and lie down but unless you give the dog your time he's not going to let up until he's until he's had it um and to you know had that fit and fit for him it's physical contact as well he wants to be patted he wants to be touched he wants to that that kind of reassurance that you're that you're still there and uh, it's interesting that as a species we don't seem to have actually developed that far past that <laughs> in the last few thousand years acknowledging and observing it you know we can learn an awful lot by looking at small children and animals yeah I, i'll give you an example i was in copenhagen a few weeks ago and we went to the zoo and in the zoo, there was a baboon enclosure. And I was fascinated by the baboons. I was standing there watching them. And the little toddler baboons who were playing chase, they were playing catch. They were, they were not catch, um, like tag. That's the tag, word. right. Tag, yeah. And I'm watching this, like, oh, the crumbs are like people. And then I watched this mother who was breastfeeding an infant. And I, I watched her. And she was looking at the children running around. And then the infant thought, huh. I'm not staying here. I've eaten now. I'm going to go and play with my siblings. So all she did was held its tail. <laughs> just drumming. It's hilarious. And this, and she just sat there, nonchalant, holding this, this infant's tail so that it didn't get rough and tumbled with, the, with its siblings. And I just I thought, gosh, we are so animal. That's the sort mm. of thing a mother would do. Yeah, very... absolutely. Hold on to the, <laughs> the back of the shirt, the hood. <laughs> <laughs> um in terms of neuroscience i'm sure there are lots of kind of myths there must be some things that you hear on a continuous basis and you think oh god not that thing again so talk talk us through your kind of top top two what are the, what are the myths that we should be busting uh, from a neuroscience perspective if i hear anyone say someone's left brained or right brained i actually <laughs> want to start foaming at the mouth <laughs> it, no, it's not like that. Because you are logical does not make you left-brained. Because you are, are creative does not make you right-brained. No, it's wrong. Don't say it. You might as well say somebody's Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. It doesn't mean anything. Okay. Mm -hmm. The complexity of the brain is far deeper than relegating someone with these two labels. So please don't do it. It's not true. Another one. Give me just before you go on to the next one. Well, like, give me give me the kind of nuance there. So how you know how how can we start to kind of categorise that, or what sort of patterns might might we see, um, you know, people displaying in those instances? We we use both sides of our brain all of the time. Yeah. Unless there's something wrong. Um, so and there's, we've got a corpus callosum, this big bundle of nerves between the two hemispheres that do a very good job of getting the singles, signals across. So, for instance, if you are talking about emotion, we are processing some types of emotion in one side of the brain, some types of emotion that's in the other side. If you're talking about language, we are we are processing uh, syntax on one side and prosody on another. So there are differences all of the time going on. There is spe hemispheric specialization, but not to the extent that people think. Not it's like black that. And white. It's far more complicated, far, far more complicated, and as it should be. And um, so, you know, if somebody, um, uh, well, no, I won't go into that experience. Okay, so um, if you are wanting to label someone, and I'm not keen on labelling at no. all. Yeah. At all, right. But if you are wanting to label someone, just say, "Oh my goodness me, you're being so creative at the moment. That's a brilliant idea. That's great. Right. You know, absolutely fine." But I do believe we're all creative in some way or other, mm -hmm. um, and there is something. But we creative creativity doesn't just mean painting a beautiful canvas. Yeah. Creativity means lots of things. So mm. I think, people are, you know, so yeah, be mindful. Um, but talk about people's talents. Don't talk about labelling them as this or that. This or that. Yeah, love that. Uh, go on, I interrupted you. What was? What's the second one that we should uh, stop talking about? Multitasking. <laughs> we don't multitask. And if it's even worse when say, oh, but you're a woman, you multitask, I'm going to go... <laughs> 
kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Just no. Um, first of all, there's no, the, the gender differences are, are not as people think. Um, mm -hmm. But secondly, um, the multitasking, we don't multitask. We actually switch. There's Task a switching. That is very, very fast. But what it does, it can slow down efficiency and effectiveness. So if you are a boss and you go into somebody's office or you call them whilst they're trying to concentrate on a piece of work or do a, do a proposal for a client or whatever um, and you're interrupting them say oh by the way we've got a minute will you do so and so so and so you have just taken their attention away and you will have cost uh, there would be a significant cost in their level of concentration and time so it's costing the organization a huge amount of money each time you interrupt someone because they're not multitasking they're switching so that's really, really a bad thing to do for business. And how do we avoid individually falling into that trap of of, of switching between tasks? Because I know that's, you know, something that I'll, I'll struggle with, especially with, you know, notifications and things ping up. And uh, you know, the, the world is designed to distract you to a certain extent. So or not to a certain extent, to a greater extent, I think it seems to be almost on a daily basis. Um, how, how do we stay in lane? Um, I'm a great fan of chunking time. So you give yourself a realistic, um, which I'm not very good at the realistic bit, but how you, you, you estimate how long something's going to take you. You chunk it down in time. You can put your, put your phone on. You can put your phone on and actually, um, you know, put an alarm on when you can stop. No, knowing that you have got that amount of time will, will, will enable you to concentrate and then you give yourself a little reward if you like you go mm -hmm. off and you make yourself a cup of coffee or you just go outside and get some fresh air you might walk around the block you might run up and down the stairs something i'm also a very a big uh, lover of incubation because i'm i create an awful lot of copy and I, I, as a speaker, I, I, most of my talks are bespoke and for the client's needs. And so, so mm -hmm. I, I spend a lot of time thinking, a lot of time creating. And I'm very well aware that when you put the brain in alpha state, we are extremely creative. Now, alpha is when you are, you know, when you wake up in the morning, that very first thing, and you're not quite awake, you're not quite asleep. Yeah. Stay there. <laughs> Don't move. Don't go jump and leap out of bed wallow in that moment because that's when you will come up with some really good answers to something that might be troubling you it's when you're in the shower all of a sudden you know you get that light bulb moment that they call mm. it and you can deliberately do that in your day you can deliberately stare out of the window and watch the rain fall as it does quite a lot in our country or um, you can just stare out of the window anyway and just watch the clouds roll by um, something where you're putting your brain in that uh, light meditative state that alpha frequency, that is when you're creative, that is when you come out with answers. And I like doing that because often I can write seven hours in, my, in front of my laptop, right? Creating copy, create, create, create. And then I'll come back to the next day and go, what a load of rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> really, Linda? <laughs> I delete, delete, delete. But I've incubated it. Yeah, I have, I have slept on it. I've 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 gone away with it. I've thought about something different, and then I come back to it, and it's better. So mm. for me, it's chunking the time, and then incubation, and going back to it again. That works yeah. for me. I love that idea. I love I love kind of having posing posing the question, and and then as you say, going and doing something else, taking the dog for a walk, or you know, driving driving to pick Nell up from school, and it's amazing that you just sort of like your brain seems to sort stuff out. That would be my way of phrasing it, you know, and pro and do the kind of processing in the background, and then you have those aha moments when you're not expecting them, when you're not actually forcing the thinking um on on the particular topic Absolutely. is is that kind of a, a a latent processing thing that's that's happening on an unconscious level there what well, if you think about the process of sleep um it is thought the function of dreams is actually like almost like a filing system so we are um we are going over the events of the day and trying to make sense of it in our long-term memory so mm -hmm. we're retrieving those memories and trying to fit it all in, which is why it makes no sense dreams, because it's like it feels like it's a mash of don't know what it is. But the brain is just trying to sort out information. 
Um, and then it lays it down, you know, you lay down the new memories because you've got now got some more context to go with that particular thing or whatever. So, mm -hmm. yes, it does. Um, and, and we need that time, that, that space just to allow the brain to ruminate, mm. to incubate. And it does, it starts to um, get information from other parts of the brain, like um, your, a long, you know, your hippocampus, your long, where long term yeah. memory, a lot of long term memory sits. Talk to me a little bit about the, the the process of of learning. So you know, as a as a speaker, you're you're saying you you're creating that, that content um, for each client in a bespoke way. Um, as an actor, I I was learning lines and you know uh, get, getting ready to to take things off script in rehearsal. And I I go through a similar process now um, when I'm speaking to an audience, but what what's sort of happening there because one thing that i always do is i i read i read the lines before i go to sleep and or you know or think through the the talk before i go to sleep and then i find miraculously when i when i wake up the next morning that more and more of it has gone in is that is that a thing or am i just sort of making it up people find um sleeping helps um uh, uh code memory yeah because you've you've actually what you've done as well is you, you're it is part of your what happened during the day your brain is trying to sort that out whilst you're sleeping but it, it's uh, you're also you have turned off any other stimuli any other distraction right. Um, so it works very well, but people will often say things like, oh, I'm a visual learner or I'm a kinesthetic learner, or, but we're not. We all learn exactly the same way by a process called long-term potentiation. Um, and, but what people have is a preference. Okay. They have a preference for visual stimuli or a, pre a preference for, for listening to something, a preference for touching something. So um, by all means, go with your preference, but always know that we all learn exactly the same way. And it's all about rehearsal. Mm -hmm. it, we've got to um, and we need to also be very mindful, especially in our marketing efforts and say, selling efforts to be mindful that um, we are um, satisfying our curiosity as well. So we, we need to, um, when we are talking to clients, we need to be stimulating curiosity. They need to want to know more about the product we're trying to sell or the service we're trying to sell. So we've got to keep doing that. We've got to keep stimulating that because the curiosity will motivate learning. It will motivate them wanting to learn about what we have to say. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where we, we can tie the curiosity back into the learning that's interesting. It's like it give it, giving them enough to make them want to, to lean in, but not so much that they want to lean out, essentially. Yeah, I mean, um, years ago, I, I was working for a, a client um, of Standard Life. You know Standard Life, yeah. the uh, insurance people? Um, um, and they would wanted to know if they put emotion in their um, marketing material, whether it would make a difference to who, to who took out pension plans and the like. Mm -hmm. So um, we wired people up to EEG and um, we, uh, they, they looked at letters on a screen, letters from a fictitious insurance company, um, a, a, a normal letter that you would get in those days from insurance company, which was exceedingly boring. <laughs> so boring. And it was all pie charts, and cheese bits coming in the pie charts and and it's like god well my husband loves that stuff thank goodness because it's really important information for me i'm going oh it's like watching <laughs> paint so um i um so they that was so that was the control then they showed letters with positive emotional words like saving for your family holidays saving for your grandchildren and then there were negative words like um uh, uh Pain. There were painful words in there, words that would create that a, a, a feeling of of um, lack. Yeah. And um, it was very interesting because the the people who um, were looking at the negative words, which is what we do in sales, fear, uncertainty, doubt, the old fashioned FUD principle, right? And mm -hmm. we're looking for the pain point. We're looking for the pain point, and this was very very um, big learning curve for them. Um, but they they certainly um, lit up certain parts of the brain that would motivate them to buy. But if the if the 
pain point wasn't now, wasn't today. And the example we gave in, in the report was if you have hemorrhoids now, you can sell them hemorrhoid cream. If you try to sell hemorrhoid cream um, and they haven't got hemorrhoids, they're going to go, oh, that's interesting and move on, right? Yeah. So, um, so there's that. However, those but if you when you showed them positive words, they that was more of a motivation for them to aspire to and actually actually galvanize them to sign up. Interesting. So it's not necessarily looking for the pain point that is the, that where you've got to be. Yep, look for the pain point if that pain point is now. Hmm. But if you don't, what the what the what the amygdala and um, which is a part of the brain that um, is first port of call for fear processing, um, if you if you're looking at that um, and you're stimulating that part of the brain, if the brain then works out there is no immediate threat, it will ignore it. So it could be that the pain points that you believe a customer or client has might be something they could have in a week or a year's time, but they're not thinking about that because they're so busy about what's about now. Mm. They need you to help them now. So, <clears throat> But if you are selling something with a more positive um, slant, they're going to lean in and yeah. be more interested. And that, that was actually quite interesting. Um, I don't even know how I got onto that, but there you go. <laughs> Uh, it was fascinating. I'm gonna. Uh, I was gonna ask you about the kind of, you know, pitch process and and what's going on in in the customer's brain. So I think we kind of touched a little bit on that there. But if you if you think about listeners going into a a pitch situation, not necessarily for for their audience, but for for them, whether they're yeah you know, pitching for a new job or whether they're pitching to their spouse to go to a particular holiday destination or the multi-million pound investment dragon's den like what's what's going on in the pitcher's brain in in that moment like because often we we feel uncertainty and doubt so what is being stimulated there the pitcher's brain the the the, the person who's pitching to the prospect yeah yeah, if it's the pitcher's brain, it depends on what the pitcher is talking about and, and the value tag that's on it. Okay. If it's a big tag, like going into Dragon's Den, then yeah. that will be petrified. They yeah. will be petrified of failure um, <clears throat> and be really, really nervous. Um, if it's something small, like trying to persuade your spouse to go to see a different film at the cinema than the one that, that, that they want to go to, um, then that's that will be different again. That will just be mm -hmm. a bit of enthusiasm, a bit of excitement. Um, but, but what you need to do, you need to really think about is <clears throat> when you are pitching to somebody, you really do need to be stimulating that curiosity in them, which may, motivates them. It's intrinsic motivation. You yeah. need to be stimulating intrinsic motivation, right? Extrinsic motivation doesn't work. And if you're a salesperson, you'll know exactly what I mean by the term sandbagging. Okay, so that if you are, you know, if you've made your numbers and you're not going to get any more commission this year, then you're going to be sandbagging, hold some back. So extrinsic motivation doesn't work in that instance mm -hmm. or in that scenario, but intrinsic motivation is more foolproof. So we need to know what that person, what will actually motivate that person individually. So we're stimulating curiosity in the prospect. Um, and that then what, what you'll get is a, a surge of dopamine um, because it's the, the reward and anticipation of reward that we're stimulating because they're thinking, oh, this is going to be good. This is going to be really, really rather useful. So they're going to be feeling good. That's thumbs up. Mm -hmm. Okay. With the trouble with dopamine is if you somewhere in the sales process let them down, they they will their dopamine levels will plummet and they will go into brain fog and they will not be able to make a decision <clears throat> so if they decision they will probably lash out they will probably get really angry um and they will or irritated by you or something because not just because you've let them down because the chemicals in the brain and that's what's going on so you don't need that you really don't need to put yourself in a position where you're letting them down hmm. so don't there, are other, <clears throat> there is another thing that, that's going on in the brain as well, is when we, are, when we are starting to build rapport with that prospect, when we are starting to build trust with that prospect, we are stimulating oxytocin again. Now, oxytocin, as I've already said, is the bonding chemical, but 
that too has a dark side. And again, it's about being let down. If somebody, if they really now are trusting you and they are going, you, that you are like this knight in shining armour who is such a relief that you're going to be helping them out on something. They are going to trust you and, and take a risk on you. And so that's difficult. So the trust is going to be very strong. Hmm. And that person will be firing on all four cylinders, which is fantastic. You let them down oxytocin will make sure they demonize you it will be worse than they didn't trust you in the first place so if you've built up this amazing font of trust with someone and then you mm. then you go wrong the only thing you can go is do is i'm so sorry i can't believe i did that i am really sorry what can i do to make make amends you have to be honest and you have to throw your hands in the air and do anything to get that back Otherwise, you, you've lost the sale completely. That's fascinating. So it, I mean, you can you can generalise that across into to, into leadership and management as well, can't you? That if you're if you're asking the team to do something, if you're asking them to go with you on a journey, and you build up that excitement and you build up that trust, that when something kind of goes wrong or the spanner happens and and you know things start to come a little bit unstuck, if you don't own that as the leader and take responsibility and be vulnerable and apologize if it, if it needs an apology then you're going to lose your team and their commitment and actually they're going to be almost working against you to unpick what's going they will on and anything you try to do thereafter they will see in a, in a negative light hmm. so it's really important that you just throw your hands up and be totally honest i'll give an example years ago when my husband and i had to go and see our solicitor now our solicitor was awfully british and terribly far back and he was a uh, he went on to be a high court judge anyway he promised to do a piece of work that david wanted my husband is david um and david and i went in there so peter because we're friends peter's levels of dopamine would have been up with an anticipation of a really lovely meeting with us mm -hmm. David's dopamine levels had risen because he was anticipating that Peter had done this thing, this job that he wanted him to do. Anyway, Peter hadn't done the work that we that David was expecting. David when David's dopamine levels had plummeted, and he went into brain fog and he shot from the hip. He really did shoot from the hip, and Peter immediately his dopamine levels plummeted because now this was an awful meeting this wasn't what he was expecting and he too was shooting from the hip and these two men were like this and i'm sitting there thinking oh for goodness sake so i'm looking around the room everywhere looking around the room and, and i saw it there was a tall cupboard and on it was peter's courtroom wig and i just said peter how do you clean your wig? And you went, good God, girl, you don't clean it. You kick it around the gutter to make it look even dirtier. And that broke it. Everybody's levels <laughs> began to rise. And then they had a sensible conversation. Can you see what I mean? Yeah, can absolutely. You, can you see what I mean? When we are working with our brain chemicals um, and we are not thinking, we are, um, we, something surprises us and we go, we, all these lovely chemicals drop. Mm -hmm. And by the way, they are very transient. They drop, they go up and down anyway. But if they yeah. really, it, then, um, uh, then we can't think clearly, and we do, mm. we do say things we regret. You don't need that in business, and you certainly don't need it with your customers. Yeah, and the, and it's that kind of what pattern interrupt something you've got to you if you're noticing that happening, you've got to do something quite drastic in order to be able to to change it, whether it's the apology or whether it's the noticing the wig on the, uh, on the back of the door, you can't allow things to keep going in, in the same you direction. Have you have to stop, you make it stop. You either stop because you're able to say something that's amusing, that's not going to hurt, hurt anyone or it's sarcastic, or you need to stop because you've got to say, I can't believe I did that, apologize and always apologize anyway, regardless, or you stop, go for a walk, get out. Yeah. You know, you can't let it. You you can't let it um, ruin a good relationship you've been working on. Mm. One of the things that we were talking about earlier was this kind of idea of uh, of task switching and and you know being able to switch off as well. 
And I, I've really noticed with the with the rise of the smartphone that we are, you know, continually connected to to our devices, and that the device, because it contains our email and our WhatsApp and our banking details and our Amazon account, it's it's kind of pulling us off in in different directions. Are our brains adapting to? that barrage of information or or is it just too much and do, do we need to try and find time away from them um evolutionary biology is a bit slow it's not as quick as the the advent of the smartphone yeah okay. so therefore what we find we do is we are in overwhelm um and it that that is very much in keeping with how many people are suffering from clinical depression now or anxiety disorder. Yeah. It's very much on the increase. It's full on pressure, pressure, pressure. So much that we receive, social media, news, news, and all, every, all of those things are fear mongering. Mm -hmm. So we, we are constantly being in a, put in a state of threat, which is also very damaging because that means our stress levels are going up. Our cortisol um, 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 hormones, hormone will be on the rise. It is really bad for us. We do need to turn it off. Mm. We, if we are concentrating on a piece of work, just turn it off. You just don't need the distraction. It's too costly. Yeah. Costly in terms of time and finance and costly in terms of your health. So um, it's, it, you do, we do need to turn it off. We're not meant to be um, you know, having these things with us all the time. We're just not meant to. It's, it is fascinating, though. I I was speaking to an audience yesterday, and uh, I asked everyone to take their their, their phone out. A little exercise that I was running, and I asked everyone to switch their phones off. And you know, 150 people in the room, and I would say at least 75 of them had a visceral like ugh, reaction to the thought of you know they were they were meant to be in the room listening to to me speak and engaging with the the, the topic that we were dealing with and just the thought of turning that off was was huge for them um I, i've got a, a 10 year old daughter and she doesn't have a smartphone but she's kind of you know of the age where she's aware of them and uh, and she's uh, asking um our, our feeling is that that's something for later but is there any kind of research that's going into what it's doing to to kids brains at the moment yeah, I mean, um, they would. That there's a lot of people who believe that um, because of phones and the like, that our attention span is getting shorter. There's no evidence for that that I'm aware of. Um, our attention span is great. I mean, you look at somebody gaming, and you'll know that their attention span is excellent. Mm -hmm. right? So, um, it, so therefore, it's not about attention, but it is about um, of of um, ability to concentrate when they need to concentrate. So they should never be in a classroom, as far as yeah. I'm concerned. Um, I can understand um, th there are benefits to phones. Um, for instance, you, they, somebody could be in, um, in a group of four friends, but one of them's at home today because they're unwell. And so they could actually be in a chat room for all four of them and actually including them. That's mm -hmm. a good thing. Right. So we, it's not like we can't demonize them. We can't think, oh, my God, these things are evil. Um, they're not. They can be used very well. But what we've got to do is not use them all of the time mm -hmm. um, and be and be careful of what we're using and clearly without young people they mustn't be on any of these um, outlets where uh, or platforms where um, un very unsavory people sit yeah um, so th there is that so we, we yeah we have to be careful I'm not key I, I don't believe they should be in class at all Mm -hmm. I think they should be uh, a teacher should have the ability to have a basket and put phones in that and, and then get on with a lesson. Yeah. I think there are certain workplaces where a basket might be useful as well <laughs> in terms of just creating uh, focus and, and a productivity, but also creating that kind of sense of social bonding. Cause I think one of the, you know, the things that I, I'm very aware of as I, I look around is, is how many people are not creating the, that oxytocin connection that you were talking about with the eye contact and uh, the the listening because we're all looking at the screen um, and not looking at each other. And we miss things, you know. There are so many social, social cues we miss. 
if we've got our head down. And you miss, I mean, you look up, you know, you, you're missing birds, the sky, you're missing good stuff. So. Stay present. Um, Linda, I, I could chat about this stuff all day. It's fascinating, and I'm I, I'm I'm going to continue to to pick your brains in in the future. But I, I want to finish the interview with a with a final question. So, if if you could go back and give that fourteen year old girl who was just reading her first books on on consciousness one piece of advice, what would it be? Um, don't take it so seriously. Just, just lighten up. Don't take it so seriously because you know I'm. You won't be Linda when you're an adult. You won't be curing cancer or having um, answers to nuclear disarmament. You won't have any of those answers. So lighten up and enjoy the process. <laughs> Absolutely fabulous advice, Dr. Linda Shaw. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. You're very welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks for listening to the Why Life's a Pitch podcast. If you'd like to improve the way you pitch and communicate, I'm giving away a special gift to all my listeners. We've developed the Pitching with Impact Scorecard to help you benchmark your pitch performance in six key areas. It'll take you less than five minutes to complete and you'll receive a detailed personalised report packed full of insights and ideas to help you improve and grow. Just head over to dominiccalento.com forward slash scorecard to get started.